Hush little baby, don't you cry I didn't mean to give you a fright We'll take you to a place where everything will be alright You don't know where you're going Won't know where you're from You'll be lucky to hide or even run but you're protected from this slum I'm just a baby they took away Over the hill so far today Don't know my family or where to look I'm just a baby that the bully man took away That the bully man took away We'll teach you how to read and write Assimilate from dark to light Your brothers and your sisters are somewhere else To protect you from yourself Little baby, don't you cry White mama buy you a brand new life We'll take you in, your future's gonna be bright A hard life full of trouble Full of nothing but pain Getting knocked down, but getting up again and again I don't expect you to understand I miss my family, I miss my land I miss my childhood I never had a chance to feel Cause your protection was never real Just a baby they took away Over the hill so far today Don't know my family or where to look I'm just a baby That the bully man took away That the bully man took away That the bully man took away The bully man took away Hush my babies, don't you cry Bully man won't come round tonight Mama won't let her babies out of her sight we stand here today on the shoulders of giants, our elders and ancestors who give us the strength from their survival. We stand here today to talk about our children, our future and our responsibility to pave a better path for them and their children. Marangdu. Thank you, Jacob Ridgway. Jacob Ridgway is a Waramai man and Masters of Creative Industries student here at the University of Newcastle, and that is his song, Bully Man. Yaradu Morang, Bujigalang, Yuundi Michelle Bovel. Hi everyone, my name is Michelle Bovel. I'm a Wiradjuri woman and NHMRC Research Fellow here at the University of Newcastle. It is my pleasure to be the MC for tonight's event, Eliminating the Gap. Thank you to HMRI for hosting this event. I would like to apologise that we were unable to secure an Auslan interpreter for tonight's event. However, we do have live captioning for those with hearing difficulties. While the captioning is quite inaccurate or accurate, it may not pick up all languages. While, uh, so we'll be releasing a professionally captioned video later in about a week's time. So watch this space. 
I would like to welcome Ray Kelly Jr, a Wobbicol and Dungari man, to offer us a welcome to country. Uh, yes, uh, thank you very much, Michelle. Um, my name is Ray Kelly. Uh, I am here to, this evening um, to represent the Pumbalung clan, and I do so in the absence of both my mother and my grandmother. Uh, I'd like to provide an acknowledgement and welcome to country. Uh, I'd like to extend that acknowledgement uh, and welcome to all uh, Indigenous people here this evening and all other families from in and around the Newcastle area. Uh, I also extend that um, that welcome to everybody out there who has uh, not been able to come in. Uh, it has been a tricky time for us over the last few months and unfortunately we can't get together the way that we'd like to through NAIDOC so we are doing our best to to adapt and to come up with new ways to be able to do that. So uh, it's been a bit difficult but um, I'd like to just say thank you to all the health pr uh, practitioners and professionals out there for doing what you do to keep us all safe. Recently uh, I was at a uh, Black Lives uh, Movement protest here in Newcastle and I was, I was reminded of when I first started protesting at the age of, I guess, four or five when I can first remember. And I, I remember the importance and I remember the, the, the strength which came from that, from seeing the elders lead the way down the streets of Newcastle. And I was just reminded that we have come so far in, in my 40 years, but there is still so much more to do. We are still talking about the same issues which have been affecting Aboriginal people since the very beginning of white settlement here in this country. Uh, we're talking about black deaths in custody. We are talking about the education gap. We are talking about employment and housing, and we are talking about health and medicine. These are the key ingredients to healthy lives and Aboriginal people continually to still be on the outer. We are still pushed to the edges and we still live in inside the fringes. Uh, I had a conversation with a younger lady and we were talking about Close the Gap and something popped into my head was, why ain't we just saying not close the gap, end the gap? And that's why we're here today, we're talking about eliminating the gap. So ladies and gentlemen, um, thank you for having me here this evening. It's my honour to provide the acknowledgement of country on behalf of my family. Uh, I hope you all have a wonderful time. I'd also like to extend that um, uh, thank you to Michelle Bovel, who has uh, had me in here this evening, uh, but also to two other great men who you're going to hear from this evening, two men who have broken through that uh, disparity and that model, uh, Dr Kelvin Kong and also uh, Nathan Towney. They are going to be able to um, give you some great advice about what we are doing here in Newcastle, uh, in particular around the university and the hospital here. And hopefully you'll get a good chance to answer some of those questions and your time here will be great. So once again, thank you and I hope you have a wonderful evening. Marangu, thank you, Ray Kelly. Due to the current pandemic, tonight's event is live streamed. We are all very new to this world. I would like to welcome over 400 participants registered for tonight's event and encourage you all to shout out who you are, where you're from and any questions that you might have. We're going to have a Q&A session at the end um, and we'd love to have some questions coming through as everyone's presenting. I would like to acknowledge our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander brothers and sisters who are connecting with us today uh, and pay my respects to your country, your elders past, present and future. I would like to acknowledge my country, Wiradjuri country and my elders past, present and emerging who guide me through all the work that I do in Aboriginal health research. The first week of July is historically a time for celebration for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people across the country, a time to celebrate our culture and our communities. Due to the current restrictions has meant that this year's celebrations have been postponed to November, but I'm sure many communities are excited to celebrate in warmer weather. As I mentioned earlier, my name is Michelle Bovell. I'm the granddaughter of Kieran Kennedy, a Wiradjuri man with connections to Kudjigong River, the land, skies and waterways. I am a mother, stepmother, um, artist, social worker and more recently a health researcher at the University of Newcastle. I completed my PhD in Aboriginal health in 2018, exploring culturally responsive approaches to smoking cessation with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women during pregnancy. My research is focused on nurturing our children who are our future elders. 
Through my research, I've had the privilege of yarning with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women across New South Wales, Queensland and South Australia on smoking and becoming pregnant. Tobacco use in Aboriginal communities is complex. Last year at this seminar, I presented on colonisation as our first social determinant of health. Tobacco use is intrinsically linked with colonisation, oppression and racism. However, much of the peer-reviewed literature in this space fails to contextualise this, but rather it positions through a deficit discourse to measure and monitor the ill behaviours of our people. However, through my research, from an Indigenous standpoint, I've been able to report a very different story. While our National Data Collection Strategy for Tobacco Progress Indicators reports tobacco smoking, yes or no, this fails to present a full picture. I was told that many health providers were not even advising our mothers to quit smoking and often revise, advise reduction in cigarette consumption rather than quitting. How will Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women ever break through the ingrained deficit discourse if we are not advised on which we are benchmarked? Women advised me that new and innovative, non-medication-based support should be offered to our women that are positioned with an understanding of our lived experience. With the support of NHMRC and the National Heart Foundation, my current research project, Which Way, partners with four Aboriginal communities in New South Wales to develop the first ever Indigenous-led evidence base for smoking cessation care in pregnancy. Over the next week, we will launch a national online survey through social media to better understand the needs and desires of Aboriginal women for smoking cessation care. This survey will inform yarning circles and a pilot trial in Aboriginal medical services of the requested support program. Maternal smoking cessation and the corresponding low birth weight of babies have been key targets in the Closing the Gap campaign. 2020 marks 12 years since the official launch of the Closing the Gap campaign. And before we discuss the current landscape of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander health and the import, it is important to look back before we can go forward, I would like to acknowledge the work of Tom Karma, our past social justice commissioner, who implored in 2005 that in order to address social justice, we must address Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander health. Karma, now the Chancellor of the University of Canberra, says he spurred an activist movement calling Closing the Gap, which then evolved into the Closing the Gap strategy as we know it. Closing the gap was taken up by bureaucrats to develop the targets and implementation. In 2008, the Closing the Gap was officially launched and by 2016, it became fairly apparent that the targets were not going to be met. And in the preceding two years, the Australian Council of Governments agreed to refresh the agenda ahead of the 10th anniversary. We often hear the words, well, what do you want? Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people have been considering, long considering and debating this exact question. In 2017, First Nations people presented the Uluru Statement, which called for structural reform. This statement states that when we have power over our destiny, our children will flourish. They will walk in two worlds and their culture will be a gift to the country. They're beautiful words. This statement remains rejected by our government. In 2018, we saw the end of the first wave of targets to eliminate health disparities, which were unmet. Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander adults and children are continuing to die at a rate disproportionate to the general population in this country. But it is agreed, reform is needed. To highlight the strength of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities in caring for our people, the 2019 Closing the Gap report moved beyond the deficit discourse and presented success in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities. This report showed that if you invest money directly into Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities and led solutions, these are the outcomes. It is no longer a mystery of how to help the poor Aborigine. In 2020, Morrison told the Parliament that despite the best intentions, 
investment in new programs and bipartisan goodwill, closing the gap has never really been a partnership with Indigenous people. But this is not the only failure in Aboriginal health. There has also been a notable lack of funding and funding that has been offered directly to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities. Improving outcomes of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander health requires new ways of working together. This will underpin the next phase of the Closing the Gap strategy. We are now at the end of a two-year process to review Closing the Gap partnership and targets. Last month, the landmark report was released, the report on engagements with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people that was prepared by the Coalition of Peaks. The report on engagement sought feedback on what should be included in a new national agreement on closing the gap, and three proposed priority reforms were reviewed. To develop and strengthen structures to ensure full involvement of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in shared decision making, embedding their ownership, responsibility and expertise to close the gap. To build formal Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander community controlled sectors to deliver Closing the Gap services and programs. And to ensure all mainstream government agencies and institutions that service Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and communities undertake systemic and structural transformation to contribute to close the gap. To offer a contextual understanding of education and its link to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander health, I would like to welcome Mr Nathan Towney, a proud Wiradjuri man who is the Pro Vice Chancellor Indigenous Strategy and Leadership at the University of Newcastle. Nathan brings with him 20 years of working in the education sector and four years as a principal of Newcastle High School. I'd like to let you know that Nathan Towney is feeling unwell, so he has pre-recorded his talk and sent this through to us. However, he'll be watching us on the live stream and will be joining in on our Q&A session at the end of this event. So if you have questions for Nathan, please add them to our Facebook feed and we'll attempt to answer as many as possible. Yeah, hi everyone. My name's Nathan Towney, proud Roger man from Wellington, New South Wales. Uh, initially, the, the live stream event, uh, I was unwell here at Hunt, the Hunter Medical Research Institute and so I did a... Uh, a pre-recording on Zoom and that was uploaded to, to cater for the live stream event. Uh, since then I've come good and I'm now in at the Hunter Medical Research Institute um, pre-recording so that uh, this can go out uh, with the other recording. So uh, just letting people know that, that watch the live stream it might, might look a little bit different now because I am actually here. So, uh, like I said, my name's Nathan Tierney. I'm a proud Wiradjuri man from Wellington, New South Wales, and I'd like to pay my respects to the traditional custodians of this land, the Awabakal people. Uh, pay my respects to elders past and present, and also acknowledge the homelands of everyone that have dialed in. Uh, I'm, a, I'm originally from Wellington, New South Wales. My mum and dad still live out there. It's, uh, it'll always be home to me. Uh, go back there as much as I possibly can. Uh, my dad grew up on the common just outside of Nenema Reserve about eight kilometres east of Wellington, so very special place to me. I'm very lucky though now to live on a Wabical country. It's a beautiful place and it will always be a special place. It's a place where both my children were born, uh, Archie, who's six, who'll be turning seven uh, in September, and Charlotte, who's three, the boss of the family, she'll be turning four in November, and they really do drive uh, everything that I do. Uh, I think, as people will know, when you have kids, it definitely puts life into perspective. And it's really shifted and changed my thinking on education. And I really do like to think of education across three generations or you know, th that generation of my father's and his, his experience with education, uh, my own experiences, and then the experiences that my children will face in education. I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, those three different generations of education. Before I get into that, I'd like to give a bit of context on my experiences. Uh, I studied PDHPE teaching at the University of Newcastle and from there taught in Scone in the Hunter Valley. I went to Sydney and taught in a number of different schools, North Sydney, uh, Western Sydney and South Western Sydney. Uh, then got a deputy principal position on the Central Coast and then <coughs> uh, moved up to Newcastle High School and spent um, six years there, finished up as principal there uh, in October last year. 
Uh, that's led me into my current role, which is the Pro Vice Chancellor of Indigenous Strategy and Leadership at the University of Newcastle, which I'm absolutely enjoying. Uh, fantastic role. And my brief really is to drive an Indigenous strategy across the university. And there's, there's quite a few different layers to that. There's an employment layer. Uh, there's a curriculum layer, really trying to support the academic staff in indigenisation of curriculum. And to do that, we need to build the cultural knowledge and understanding of staff and students. And there's also a research layer, so thinking about um, how we can in increase the number of Indigenous-led research projects that, that happen across the university, but also support all researchers to have an Indigenous lens in the research that they conduct to Im improve outcomes for our people. Uh, one of the things that I want to talk about today, um, obviously the title of the, of the, the talk is, is Eliminating the Gap. I want, to, I want to do a little bit of a historical view on education and what education actually means and what it means to Aboriginal people historically, but also what it means today. And, and also I talk, I talk about education and schooling very differently because um, schooling is a, is a place where education is very important, but it's not the only place where we receive our education. So I do use those terms separately. Uh, I want to go back to, I guess, what education actually means. And, and when you, you look at the definition of education, it's about the acquisition of, of knowledge and skills and um, being able to contribute to your community and your society effectively. And that, that's the purpose of education. At some point, somebody needs to determine what knowledge and skills are important enough to be included in some type of education. And historically, uh, Aboriginal education was, was focused around um, many things, but in particular, the, the foundation of that was Aboriginal law and also um, the connection to country and the maintain, maintain, maintaining and the sustainability of country. And so at the time of invasion, um, the settlers brought many things to Australia, but one of them was, was their own views on what was important in terms of the knowledge and skills to pass on through education. And so when the first school was established here in Newcastle, Newcastle East Public School in 1816, uh, the curriculum, that's basically what the knowledge and skills that, that were chosen to be important was established. And the Aboriginal uh, historical education views were basically val not valued. And the knowledge and skills that were, that were taught for thousands and thousands of years uh, across our communities um, were no longer relevant. So Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children were thrown into a system that didn't value what our culture has valued for thousands and thousands of years. So that's had a major impact on generations over time and, and how Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people relate to education. You know, you, you really look at that as a... Um, the, the, the non-Aboriginal communities, there was, there was a, a feeling that they were superior and that the knowledge and skills that they felt were important were far superior than what um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander knowledge and skills were. That, there's a number of policies that have, been, that have been established on that premise. And the first one I'm going to talk about is the assimilation policy. You had, you had the assimilation policy that basically said we want to absorb Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people into the non-Aboriginal way of life and, and um, get rid of the, the cultural values, the language, um, so that everybody can be equal. Uh, but then you also had some very racist views, which meant that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people couldn't uh, do those things and, and couldn't have access to um, a lot of the, the things that non-Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people had access to. And school is a prime example of that. If you look just in New South Wales, uh, there's, a, there's a couple of policies I'm going to talk about, but there's a, there's a really uh, amazing resource developed by what was then the Board of Studies, now the New South Wales Education Standards Authority, which is a timeline of Aboriginal education in New South Wales. There's a couple of things I want to talk about. Uh, the first one is the exclusion on demand policy, which was a policy um, developed by the Education Minister in 1902, John Perry, uh, which basically gave principals and, and schools the authority to expel Aboriginal children if a non-Aboriginal parent didn't want their child going to school with an Aboriginal family or, or student. Um, you can imagine how that made Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities feel um, and the impact that that had on how they felt about structures and systems like schools. So already we're, we're telling Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people that the knowledge and skills that have been important for thousands of years are no longer relevant 
but then we're also telling them that they don't have a place to belong in this education system um, just because of the colour of their skin or their, their, their identity. The second policy is the clean, clad and courteous policy, um, which basically is that, that as long as the, the, the policy stated that as long as Aboriginal children were clean, clad and courteous and fitted uh, those criteria, then they were able to attend school. However, if the principal or, or the school felt that they didn't meet that criteria, then they were excluded from school and were returned home. Um, both of those policies, the exclusion on demand and clean, clad and courteous policy, were not uh, removed until 1972. And so, you know, we're not talking about um, hundreds of years ago. Uh, we're talking about um, current students, parents and grandparents that were impacted by these policies. And, and you know, they're, they're still impact of those policies today in terms of how Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people feel about school, um, it's school structures. So what does that mean for us now? Well, we're now faced with a, a, um, a set, of, set of policies that tell us that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people um, are not performing as well, surprise, surprise, in schooling structures, uh, and that we need to close the gap, and there's a gap between Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal learners. Um, I challenge the fact that are we measuring the right gap? Um, you know, we're, we're, we're still framing the gap and, and the things that matter based on the, the non-Aboriginal ways of thinking. Um, and it also has a very, a very negative um, connotation to it. And, and I, I always like to think, well, uh, uh, are we measuring the right gaps? Should we be measuring things like how many uh, teachers feel that they can cater for the, the, the specific learning needs of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander students? Is that something that we should measure? And that completely changes, changes the narrative in terms of where the problem lies. Um, should we be measuring how many schools have genuine, authentic partnerships with their Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander parents and communities and the Aboriginal organisations that exist within their communities? That would be a really good measure. Um, should we be measuring how many, uh, Aboriginal, uh, how many teachers have had cultural awareness training um, before they teach Aboriginal students and, and, their, and their families and, and are put into our communities. Now, these are some of the things that I think we really need to, to address in terms of uh, improving outcomes for Aboriginal children, is what are we actually measuring? And as you can see, our, our progress hasn't been good. Out of the seven uh, targets that were, that were set um, around closing the gap, that we've only have two that are on track. And it's great that we have two that are on track. We have 95% uh, of, of Indigenous four-year-olds enrolled in early childhood education by 2025. We're on track with that. It's fantastic. We, there's a lot of research that tells us that um, engagement in prior to school settings um, has, a, has a really great impact on, on learning outcomes. We also have a number of uh, Aboriginal Indigenous students uh, reaching and completing Year 12 or the equivalent of Year 12, and that's fantastic. It's great that we're having more students um, having success and, and actually um, retain, being retained at school. Whether or not that gap is, um, that target was, it was a stretch target and something that, um, you know, is something that we, we should be proud of is, is another question. There's, there's a strong correlation between the importance of education and the impact that that has on health. So, you know, these are really important conversations to have together and I'm, I'm very excited that and I'm very thankful that the Hunter Medical Research Institute have, have asked me to come and present as part of this. Um, when we talk health, I think it's really important that we talk education as well. Um, there's a national survey that's completed, which does show the, the direct correlation, the direct links between family education influences on health, but then also family health influences on education. And there's strong correlations there. And as someone that's been in schools for the last 20 years, um, you can see that. You, you, you see that when families and, and students come into the school. Um, and as an educational leader, um, I felt as though I couldn't really focus on the educational outcomes of a student if their well-being and their health wasn't up to scratch. And so it's really about thinking very differently about um, what's important and making sure that a student's well-being and health is at the centre of what schools focus on as well, because we really can't engage in productive learning until we've actually done that properly. Um, so there are a lots of really good things that are happening in schools right across Australia, and there's, there's lots of uh, success that's been happening. 
One of the things that I really focus on as an educational leader is the concept of sense of belonging, creating an environment where Aboriginal students and families want to be. And to me, that, that is at the core of where we need to move. And that's at the core of um, some of those, those strategies that I suggested around measuring the gap. Um, if we can create an environment where our Aboriginal students and families want to be, then it makes learning um, happen so much easier. And there's some prime examples of, of some schools that have done that. There's a local school here in the Hunter that had a, a, um, initiated a strategy where they basically pulled a group of year eight um, boys out of class for a, for a 12 month period um, when they started year nine. So they identified the boys when they were in year eight, um, pulled them out of class for, for the whole year, for their year nine year, um, and really concentrated on the core of creating that sense of belonging for these students. They were all at risk. They were all um, had high suspension rates. They were they had low attendance. Um, their their health wasn't good, and the risk taking behaviour was quite high. And so the school really focused on um, creating that sense of belonging and, and identifying with the students and their families the things that were going to be important for them in their lives moving forward. So they did some some really um, amazing things. They they learnt to uh, they built a motorbike from scratch. Uh, they they went and um, set up a partnership with an aged care facility and built some relationships with uh, with the residents in the aged care facility. Made tea, cups of tea and coffee for the residents. They um, created some activities and games for the for the group as well, and really started to build a relationship with those residents. And the impact that that had on those boys was immense. Um, the boys started to see that the school cared about them in a different way. Um, they weren't expected to just go and sit in a in a classroom where the learning. Um, had no relevance and maybe their literacy and numeracy skills meant they couldn't access the learning anyway. Um, and through that program, there was a really strong focus on, on developing the core literacy and numeracy skills so that the students could, could um, have further success in the senior years of schooling. Um, that program had some amazing success. Um, the majority of those students um, went on to complete Year 12 and those that didn't went into employment. Um, so, you know, fantastic outcomes and, and results there. Um, the second, <coughs> the second uh, thing that I want to talk about in education <coughs> in terms of pockets of brilliance and things that are, uh, a system that is doing amazingly well for Aboriginal students is um, a system called Big Picture Education, which really places the student at the centre of their learning and developing a curriculum around a student's interests and passions. And um, when, you, when you think of education in that way, it really does break down the system of, of telling the students about what's important and actually letting the students develop that, letting the students and their families develop what's important for them and create a curriculum that centres around that student's learning needs. So within a big picture school, you might have 17 students in the classroom that are all working on completely different things. Um, the, the structure is the same, um, but the content and what they're actually doing are completely different. They're expected to go out and work into the, in the community one day a week and, and um, around what it is that they're learning about so that it's actually relevant and they're, they're applying that learning into real life practice. Um, underpinning all of that needs to be cultural recognition. For far too long, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander culture has not been valued and recognised in education, uh, in schooling settings. And so the, the, the that's something that schools are getting better at and it's something that education systems are getting better at. Um, the Aboriginal education policies now exist within most uh, systems and that's really good to see. It's about improving the outcomes of, of Aboriginal students but also equally as important with that is educating all students and stakeholders about Aboriginal history and culture. And for us to really move forward that needs to be equally as important is, is that whole um, increasing cultural knowledge and understanding of all stakeholders that engage in schools. Um, lastly, I'd just like to, to go back to my own children, um, Archie and, and Charlotte, and I've got a slide that, that shows my, my, my son with my father, um, Ab Towney, uh, and my daughter Charlotte with my mum, Sue Towney. And I want to go back to them because I, I want to go back to that, that, that talk I did at the start about the generational um, impact of education. Uh, you know, I, I think about what I want for my children in, in their, their education compared to mine and compared to my dad's experiences in education in school. And I want, I want my children to grow up in an education that is, that is shared responsibility between the school and, and my family and my community 
And, you know, even though we live off country, uh, you know, the Wellington community will play a big part in my ch children's upbringing. And, um, you know, the elders in that community uh, will, will play a big part in, in my, fam my, ch my children's education. Um, I want the school to understand that and respect that, which um, is going to be really important moving forward. I want them to be able to have school as a place that's culturally safe where their history is valued and recognised and celebrated. And I want to share a, a story of um, my, my little fella who was just in the last week of term, term uh, that's just finished, and his classroom teacher uh, placed online uh, an image of uh, a, vi a clip of my, my son sitting at the front of the class uh, with the seat up thinking he's the teacher. I don't know who he takes after. Uh, but teaching his whole class about the didgeridoo. So he had his didgeridoo that Uncle Paulie West from Wellington made him. And, um, yeah, he was, he was making the noise, the different animal noises to the in the class. The kids in the class thought it was fantastic. They were all sitting with their legs crossed, looking up, um, you know, looking at Archie and Archie explaining and just being so proud of being able to share a part of this culture that he that he's um, he's so proud of. Um, that school also provide uh, someone, an Aboriginal man that comes in and, and teaches didgeridoo, not only to, to Archie and the Aboriginal students at the school, but also to non-Aboriginal students at the school. Um, I've, I've had a number of phone calls from families from that school requesting how can we get a didge, um, where can we get them from. My, my son is absolutely loving this. They, you know, they're so keen to learn more about um, not just the didgeridoo, but more about Aboriginal culture. And, you know, schools are, are really playing a big part in, in changing that narrative for how Aboriginal people are viewed. And the fact that potentially, or not potentially, definitely, the knowledge and skills that our, our people passed on over thousands of years are very important. And they're knowledge and skills that should be valued and recognised in schools at the moment. You now, the United Nations have um, sustainability development goals that exist across, across the globe. You know, when you look at those, there's direct correlation between um, the care for country, care for community and looking out for each other. And I think that the, the, the more we can look back um, before we look forward, uh, we're going to improve outcomes for, for our people. Thank you very much. Marangu, thank you, Nathan. While not all new targets have been officially released, we know that our peak bodies have signed off on 16 refreshed targets with the Minister for Indigenous Australians. The targets will cover issues such as education, employment, health and wellbeing, justice, safety, housing, land and waters, and languages. These agreements are just the beginning. We need more evidence of best practice, better service delivery, and more funding directed directly to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities who we know, and we have the data to support this, deliver better quality care to our people. There might be no higher level of quality care for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people than to have our very own surgeon. Kelvin Kong is a proud Waramai man and the first Aboriginal surgeon who works as an ear, nose and throat surgeon here in Newcastle. I would like to welcome Kelvin. All right. Um, good evening, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us uh, this evening. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here, and I certainly want to acknowledge um, the welcomes that we've had, and also to Ray Kelly Jr. It's always nice to catch up with him um, in welcoming us to Wabakal lands. I do want to pay my respects to the Warramai Nation, um, just north of the Wabakal lands, um, for where I'm from, and also acknowledge that the involuntary sacrifices that a lot of our people made have allowed us all to flourish and be in this land, and I certainly stand on the shoulders of those who've been before me. Um, it's really important for me to acknowledge the people I work with, because the people I work with um, make all this happen. Um, these are the various representations of the organisations that I work for, and I also want to acknowledge um, Marie Gleeson, who is our previous director, who's standing in the audience this evening, and also Tom Waller, who's our current director of HMRI. Um, I think the, the strength of this organisation in being present here tonight is certainly not taken lightly and certainly something that I, I do want to acknowledge for that. I also want to acknowledge who's online tonight, Sharon Hall, who's my research buddy and friend, um, who's had some sorry business in her family and love to all the family and thank you for your support as well. 
Um, I do need to acknowledge that there are some um, conflicts and I think it's quite um, different in the way we talk about it. I want to briefly go through some of my passion and context of the research I'm doing. I also want to put that in the context of what we're looking at in the current climate. And also, I guess, for me, I'm not here to bombard you with statistics. I'm not here to bombard you with stuff that I think should happen. I just want to open your minds and just think a little laterally about how you think about things in relation to our health and how we can actually do something. And I'm, I think I'm a bit beyond those things of uh, something needs to be done, let's do something. I want everyone to individually think about what they can do tweet it, Facebook it, um, let's talk more and let's really get some action going on how we can actually help this. Um, and so the disclosure conflicts often don't let you present stuff that you're actually in a conflict for. And if that were the case, I wouldn't be presenting tonight because everything I do is in conflict with I am. Um, I'm a surgeon, I love operating, I love working with kids, I love working with uh, people, I love helping fixing people. So if it means that my work brings more work my way, then that's a conflict, but it's actually something I strongly believe in. Um, as a strong researcher, I will throw those forms in front of you and say you need to sign this and be part of our research consortium because I think it's important for us to realise that research in the old context is well beyond that. Research is about how we find the right answers to get the answers we want to actually make the difference we need in the community. It's not about doing a bit of research about looking at something and publishing something. It's about how we make a difference in Australian society. I think that's important for us to remember and never forget that. Um, I work across a lot of Aboriginal Australia and I think I'm really proud and very humbled and extremely privileged in the working life I have because I get to visit places that a lot of you people would never see and that's a really cool thing because I think you see things and it opens my mind because in more of my country it's very different to over in different parts of Australia that we see and it brings home messages. As a warrior, my man, I stand proud, I stand tall, and it's really important for me because I've been given this privilege because of the people before me. And so if I didn't do this research and work, then I think I'm actually doing a disservice to maybe with people who have fallen before me. And finally, my family is the most important thing to me. And so my family is my passion. My family is why I do this, because without my family, I wouldn't have the strength to be able to go through this every day. And it starts with this slide here, which is my two kids. And I know my wife's watching, I know I've got three kids, but this is the best way of the two kids who I want to talk about tonight, so don't beat me up about that. This is Lewis and Ellery, and they provide a lot of joy for me. But one of the important things about um, what I see with my children, both Lewis and Ellery, is the difference they had in ear disease. And ear disease is one of my big passions, and ear disease is one of my big research aspects. And that ear disease is something we see all the time. And so when we talk about the speech, you can see Lewis, as a baby, singing, articulating well, dancing well, coordinating well, which is really nice to see. Comparing that to my daughter, a little younger at this kind of age, but it's really striking to me is that the way we interacted with her was only through loud noises. A loud clap, a loud bang, something that startled her to actually be able to hear some of that sound that's going forward. And that was quite concerning. Closely associated with ear and ear disease is your balance. And similarly, you can see with Lewis, without ear disease, his agility, his balance, his interaction, his play is quite good and fun. And you can see that movement work really well. Compare that again to my middle child, a little younger admittedly, but look a fall over. Lewis is just pretending to fall over, but she actually falls over because the balance is so poor. And that's a big issue that we're worried about. And what we see when we look in her ears is a picture like this of otitis media, of glue ear, of infected ear disease, unhappy kid. And although those pictures I show are the fun ones, the reality is it actually impacted our family and impacted it in a bad way, in quite a severe way, where her speech was quite delayed, where her balance was quite delayed, where her balance was delayed. And I hate to say this, I was sexist. I just blamed that her being a girl and also as a boy. And I think that's dreadful to say that. And we often put it down to that, but it's actually seeing that and actually acknowledging that. And I have to put a shout out to Professor Paul Walker, who actually fixed my daughter, because without his intervention, it wouldn't have been able to be done. And my wife was sick of arguing with me, saying there's something wrong with our daughter, we need to get it checked out. And I'm going, nah, it's all right. And here I am as an ear surgeon and be embarrassed by that. And so when we look at this picture of ear disease, there's a lot of middle ear effusion that's going on there. So the fluid's in the ear and the fluid can't get out of there, so they can't hear all that well. 
I'm not here to talk about anatomy, I'm not here to talk about the disease process, but what I'm talking about here tonight is how we actually navigate our way through the health system to get the health we need to, how do we get the research papers to actually prove what we need to prove, how do we get the evidence to make sure that we can eliminate this gap that we talk about. And the reality is there are a lot of barriers in place. There are barriers in the system, there are structural barriers, there are systemic barriers, but most importantly there's just access issues that we struggle with in trying to manage this. And so we look at one of my typical clinics I look at in some of the outreach clinics. These are the kind of ears you see. Lots of ear disease process, lots of holes in the eardrums, lots of disease which is causing the most important thing, which is hearing loss. And I love this diagram. And this diagram is very important to point out. And if you look at it closely, you can see that this is how the brain develops or the neural plasticity as we talk about. And in the early stages of life development, there are a couple of things that we need to make sure we do. Number one is hear, number two is see, and then number three is speak. And as we get those skill sets put forward, we start to design our cognitive function so that we can actually hear, speak, listen, coordinate all that, understand all that. And so the important timeline I want you to see on the bottom of the screen is that before zero, that means in pregnancy, this is already starting. The development of these things are already starting. So if you're born and you're in the ages between zero and four and you're not hearing, then you're gonna be behind in all your education for the rest of your life and I dare say for your employment opportunities. And it's such a passion of mine because it's something that can be rectified that we need to look after. So we look at these kind of developmental milestones and graphs we see, early on it's all about listening, song lines, getting grandmothers to sing to their kids, telling them stories, telling them yarns, interacting with children, interacting with each other, and actually learning from each other so they can speak. Then when the first words come out, they start uh, parroting what they're hearing around them, which is just so, so important. Not only from an education point of view, but from a life point of view. And certainly around our Warramai country, there's a lot of yarns to be told and a lot of stories to be told, and I think it's really important for us to actually acknowledge those. So here's a really important slide. This is unpublished data yet, but will be published soon. And again, our Hearing Australia colleagues who are online tonight, thank you for your um, assistance and working this. It's been a real pleasure working with you for this. But this is what we've found. For children aged zero to three in Australia, there's an observed time to get help for your ears. That means seeing someone, getting hearing tests, seeing your local doctor, seeing an intersurgeon, seeing hearing aids, getting things organised. Zero to three. If you go through the public system, it is a 36 month wait in remote areas, it is a 51 month wait in the regional areas, and a 42 month wait in urban areas. So that's probably looking at three to four and a half years. So if your child's diagnosed with a hearing loss, as my daughter was, for you to get through the process, they're going to be already started school. Really important to think about that because that means they're starting school, not talking properly not listening properly, not being able to interact properly, and therefore the rest of their schooling is going to be set up with disaster. And it's no wonder we have a lot of these issues with behavioural concerns, language barriers, and all the biases kick in. And that's a really nice segue to talk about what it means to have these biases. Because if we're truly serious about eliminating the gap, it's no longer just about doing grommet surgery. It is no longer just about interacting in the healthcare system. It is about what are we as society as researchers, as clinicians, as people of this community value and how to actually change the way in which we interact. And so some of the questions I often get in today's climate really dis disappoint me and probably dishearten me more than anything. Um, the comments like, we are not America. Um, why is it so different in Australia and America? Well, it's actually not that different. Maybe different from what you're seeing in the media. Um, we don't experience racism in Australia. You can certainly see from our Black Lives Movement um, the protests, you're seeing a lot more sim similarities that we see. Let's not dwell on the past. Um, the statues are part of our history. You don't want to rip down statues which are like 20 years old compared to some of the paintings I've seen which are 50,000 years old. Um, let's, not, let's look at the real problems. Not, not, let's not get distracted by some of this media stuff that's going on there. When in actual fact, the media stuff is an important part. And it's really nice, the picture on the left-hand side is a picture I took last week when I was going for a walk with my son. And it was of the uh, star, and it looked like a shooting star in the picture, which I kind of laughed at. It was actually Lewis bumping me when we were doing a walk, and so the star just kind of shook. And I guess the point I'm making there is that it's all about perception and what you see. And I think that's really important. Um, this is, again, a picture of Lewis and Ellery um, and my late mother. And the reason I say that is because the biases in what we interpret in every day happens all the time, and it's devastating for me. 
We make quick assumptions and we do this because it helps us think quickly on our feet. So as a surgeon, if there's a medical emergency, you make quick assumptions about how the patient's deteriorating, what's happening at scenario, and evidence in the research I've read helped me make that decision. The problem with that is that when it actually affects the health from adverse outcome, we also need to recognise that our biases will actually change the way we think. And I want to go back to a society example, and I'll come back to the medical examples later. So Lewis was watching TV the other day, and he was watching an NITV program, and there was Aboriginal elder um, on TV doing some painting. Dad, Dad, come over here, look, it's Grammy. And he was talking about my grandmother, which is, sorry, his grandmother, my mother. And I looked at this lady, she looked nothing like my mother, nothing at all. She was an Aboriginal woman, she was from Central Australia, she was painting, she was speaking in language, none of these things are applicable to my mother. And it broke my heart that at an at a age of four years of age, he's already interpreting what society is saying Aboriginals are. And that is that they're Central Australia, that they're painters, they're speaking language. And he was a liking to this. And I challenge all my listeners out there, for their children, how many of them see a white old lady on TV and say, Dad, here's Grandma, come and have a look. Now, of course they don't, because they individualise the process, yet in the early brings of what we're talking about children, we're starting to say we should collate this as a generalisation. I think that's already the problem that we're starting to develop. Similar examples that it happened with Bush Tucker. He told me, Dad, did you know that Aboriginals eat kangaroo and they go catch it and kill it? I said, hang on, you're a Koori fella. You've had kangaroo, did you catch it? And there's a whole conversation about where he hears this from, where he learns it from. Um, and even an you know, example about clothing and what you wear and what Aboriginals wear and what they shouldn't wear and all this kind of stuff. And it, it just baffled me that he is in under my roof with my family, with my extended family, and yet the ideals that he talks about, and it really confused him when we talked about it because he is contemporary Aboriginal Australia. Yet the thought process has already started in him and how our biases inflict on them. So how much does media play a role in our health landscape? These are the kind of things we see time and time in the media. It just baffles me why this continues to happen when we know it's a reality. But the problem with it is that it's clickbait for the media organisations to actually like this. So for them to get Pauline Hanson on there, who continually says inappropriate things, who's continually uh, disingenuous about her intentions, who is in continually trying to put down other people, and yet they put her on the program, ask her to say these things, knowing that it's going to create some clickbait, and then say, well, actually, you know what, we disagree with her comments. Well, if you disagree with her comments and you know that that's going to happen, then never put on there in the first place. Yet it continues to happen. Same thing with a lot of other the breakfast programs, the early morning programs, all exactly the same in some of those aspects, which actually, when you reflect on it, think about how there's always this commentary about closing the gap, about Aboriginal disadvantage, about Black Lives Matter, which don't actually involve Aboriginal people. So for me, for a start, you don't even have that conversation. And I think that should be applied in, um, in research fields and that should also be applied in the medical field, which we actually experience the same. And a similar kind of thing where Bill Leake continually puts cartoons in mainstream media um, broadsheets around this kind of thing. And this, uh, this one really, um, really hurts me a lot because it's talking about an Aboriginal father and as an Aboriginal father, and I know many guys um, who are just absolutely amazing fathers and I don't have to go into examples of those. So to have that portrayed as that, how we are is quite terrible. And so how does that apply in the teacher in a classroom? Well, hang on, does this only happen back in 100 years ago, back in 1902, as Nathan was talking about? Well, actually it happens right now. In our classrooms now, we're seeing this racism occur. So you so recently, as, as much as two weeks ago, I think it was, where one of our teachers in our local high schools had to apologise after a racist rant in the school. And so then you get the commentary from colleagues and staff and friends go, oh, yeah, but you don't know what was said there, you don't know how it happened. And when you look at some of the reporting on it, the patient made disparaging comments about Indigenous Australians, about housing, about taking money from the government, about being bludgers. And then the teacher said the best thing that ever happened to Aboriginals is European settlement. And then four kids piped up and said, we're actually Aboriginal. And then she continued and said, but you guys don't look Aboriginal. So again, it's that mindset, and this is in our, our, our education system, where we're starting to see this, where our children are not protected at all. And that's quite hurt, hurtful in many aspects. And so when you see that kind of stuff, it's no wonder then that we get in trouble with the law so much. And when you see clips like this come across, and again, this only happens in America, it's not true. When you see that clip there, there was, I'll go back to it. 
you can see that um, there was a teenage Aboriginal boy, this is in Sydney, who was um, having an argument with the police, tripped over, chipped his front teeth, fractured his nose, ended up in hospital. And when you look at the reporting of the incident, the reporting was that the police were threatened by these kids and so therefore they had to succumb them with enough force to make sure they didn't get hurt. The police officer in this scenario had to walk across the pathway to actually get this kid whose hands were behind his back and handcuffed and then actually inflicted that injury on him. Now, I'm not trying to say I was in that situation, but I'm just saying that this kind of stuff happens where there's biases that are put in place. And I don't blame the individual in the scenario. I blame the systems in place that allow this to happen because they're already making assumptions about who they're dealing with and how the best way to deal with this situation. And that's where we need the education. So it's no surprise to me that when you look at incarceration rates associated with Aboriginal people, that it's just so high. More than half of our juvenile prisons are filled with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander kids. In Northern Territory, at one particular time last year, 100% of the juvenile prisons were filled with Aboriginal kids, yet they make up such a small proportion of our population. New South Wales has more than 30% of the male prison population as Aboriginals, yet we make up less than 3% of the population. And these stats are worse in, in WA. And I think what strikes me this is that the laws around the incarceration tend to favour are non-Indigenous counterparts. So they tend to be crimes of poverty, not paying bills, not paying infringements, so you can't pay them, so therefore you get locked up, as it happened in WA a lot of the time. And then therefore the victims actually get um, more inflicted with trauma, and it goes on, and, and I don't want to go into the deaths in custody associated with that because it's quite traumatic. But I think that stratification of what we're looking at there is how the society plays it, because it's actually a systemic structural problem. It's not necessarily just a problem of the incarceration. And so you then come down to um, this comment of, I'm not racist, but, and it's so many times you hear that. We live in a society that accepts this. We accept this as an us versus them mentality. And that us versus them mentality is already means that we're behind the eight ball, because it shouldn't be about that. The way it should be looked at is that if this is your child, how would you want your child to be treated? If this is your father or mother, how would you want them to be treated? And that's the angle in which we need to do to make sure we eliminate this gut. Our system tends to support those who jump up and down the most. And unfortunately, you don't have a voice in mainstream media. Unfortunately, you don't have a voice in all these uh, important decision-making processes. It means that you're far behind in what you're looking at. And we continually deny the existence of these barriers. If only these kids would go to school. If only these parents would get their kids looked at. These are the kind of things that we look at when we're trying to fix a problem. So it's not about the ear disease and waiting for the ear disease, it's about how we actually get that access to them. And it really impairs on, or imparts on, some of that racial stratification we talk about. And I don't want to go into this too much because I think I'm running out of time. Um, but, you know, some of the simple things, a doll experiment you could look up online, it's a wonderful experiment done in the 70s looking at how kids interact. And it's a little bit about how my son was interacting. Um, it's about service at shops, it's about service at pubs, where to sit. You know, when I turned 18 and went to the pub with my uncles for, you know, congratulations turning 18, it wasn't about cheering and having fun. It was, when you go to a pub, this is where you sit. You're sitting in the exit. If something goes down, you can get out quickly. You're not going to be trapped. Don't go somewhere you're going to be trapped. Those kind of things we think about, you don't think about, and I don't think my colleagues had those kind of conversations when they turned that ages. Um, and it's not yesteryear. I keep bringing examples into today because today is a time where that happens. Um, referrals I receive now, and it's maybe a bit of positive discrimination, it's wonderful, but that's always highlighted and put in bold, this patient is Aboriginal because I know that we're going to look looked after it, that's the case. But the fact that there's a reverse race in there where I'll get called whether I'm on call or not if it's an Aboriginal patient because I want to make sure they get looked after. And it shouldn't be in that way. It should be a system problem that actually looks at that. Even to simple things as walking to hospitals and being um, affronted with different things. I won't go into those stories. Um, I'm skipping through these last couple of slides very quickly because I, uh, we're running out of time here. But I guess the point I want to make is that we need to think bigger about what we do to achieve this eliminating gap. We need to solve the root problem. It's no longer just about let's provide more services. It's about how we look at our structures, how we look at our systems to make sure that we're doing well. Um, what things are we doing as researchers that contribute to this? Do we actually put more stuff into research around heavily weighting and change the goalposts to actually make sure that we're caring about our patients? And how do we actually translate that information appropriately? 
that needs to be multifaceted. It can't be about, let's get one doctor in this program, let's get one reach in the program. It's about how do we bring the whole community forward. And I think that's really exciting about how we're trying to look at some of those structural barriers to change those. I think it's really important that it's not just this one-off approach, that we're actually looking at the bigger picture. And so when you look at the Black Lives Matter protests, rather than turning up an eye or getting passionate about it, reflect on yourselves, look in the mirror and talk to people, friends and family around you because I think the most interesting conversations are the conversations where there's no Aboriginal people present because they actually say what they think and how they actually challenge and it's up to us to challenge some of those thought processes because this is not about deaths in custody per se. It's about how Australia reacts to this racist society that we're plagued with and the structures that are in place that are favouring the other people. And so we can really make a big difference associated with that. We really do need a strength rates approach. The difference in what I'm seeing in the people coming through now in medicine and in researchers is changing. And so as an organisation, we need to change with it and we need to move that appropriately so that we support that and encourage that so we can make a real difference. I might stop there then. So we're going to lead to some questions. Thank you. Marangu, thank you, Kelvin. It's very hard for us to do something that only goes for one hour when we have three black fellas up on stage. So I apologise, but hopefully we've given you some something to think about and reflect on. Um, and thank you so much. We're getting some great comments, lots of love and support coming through on the live feed. And it just makes us feel so so good it's very different doing it virtually so it's great to see that people are connecting with us and people are engaging so thank you so much keep them coming uh, i'd like to say on behalf of myself nathan and kelvin marangu thank you so much for joining us virtually and offering us a space to share our voices our stories and our experiences we do have a short q a time we are getting close to our suggested ending time, but we do have a few questions that we will be able to answer for you. So I'll invite Kelvin back up on stage and my sister Jessica Bennett, who is a Gumori woman, a NICU nurse and a lecturer at the University of Newcastle to talk us through some of the questions that have come through. Feel free to still pop in some quick questions if you feel. You ready? Yeah. Yeah, I'm all, I'm Jessica Bennett, I'm a Gumori Yinna. So we're gonna get right into the Q&A section for this evening. So first off, we do have a question from the Yaren community, um, which is for Nathan Towney, who has sent through his response uh, for me to read out to everyone. So the question was, how can ATCHOs secure long-term workforce placement for graduating Aboriginal clinicians, such as our GPs, our nurses, our allied, allied health and Aboriginal health um, professional workers? And why is there too much emphasis based on hospital place services and rotations? So Nathan has said, part of our university's new strategic plan is a commitment to work integrated learning. So he would love to work on a model where Aboriginal students are placed within ATROS and providing an opportunity for relationship building and an increased chance of long-term employment. We, he would also like to look at a workshop for Aboriginal students where the local and regional ATROS would come and talk to them and also let them know about the employment opportunities and he'll be in contact soon, Paul, he promises. So my next question is for Kelvin. So this question is from Catherine, who's a school teacher. And at the beginning of the year, the school attempted to organise for all their Aboriginal students to have their hearing and ear health assessed. Something they intend to do annually, at least for our kindergarten students and for any new school students that are attending the school. They are aware that ear disease can have a significant impact on Aboriginal students' social, emotional and academic capabilities. And they wanted to identify and support any students and families with hearing and ear health needs. So her question is, what is the better option for testing that we don't know about as a school teacher? And is there professional development that staff can have that allows them to better understand ear health, hearing issues and how to support students and families to the best capability who do have hearing issues? Yeah, absolutely. Um, wonderful question. And I might just tack on to Nathan's answer as well, if I may, before I answer Absolutely. that one. Um, it's really important also to make sure that our Aboriginal um, health professionals that are training aren't um, pushed into Aboriginal health. They're going through to address the professional inequality and that alone is an amazing step. If they choose to go down this pathway, I think it's really important to support them. And similarly, our non-Indigenous colleagues, we need to bring them on board to show that it's exciting. As a Warramai man, it hurts me to say that 
um, there is such bad health outcomes. But as a surgeon, it is a fantastic because the amount of stuff you see is incredible. So as a learning tool, it's, it's really good. Um, and thank you for your question, Catherine. I think it's really good. I think um, the question that you answered is really hard to answer because if you're getting to school level, we've already missed half the boat. So I'd go back to talking to parents and families to get the younger kids um, tested earlier and, and quickly is important. There is a wonderful cohort of nurse audiometrists and hearing specialists that can actually help in that aspect. But also I think it's up to our role then and one of the projects where we got that data from was how do we develop questionnaires that are easily used by parents at home because they're our soldiers to actually identify where the problems are. So if you've got a validated questionnaire, and the one we're using at the moment is Plum Hats, which is fantastic, to look at um, certain things that kids can do and say and interact with, then it automatically screens us into a place where we can actually see where that is. To answer the question more directly, we need to jump up and down and make sure hearing assessment is part of that. We need to make sure that um, primary care physicians, um, general practices and our archos are really, really well equipped and that's our responsibility to make sure that they have the appropriate equipment and the appropriate training to do that. And I think one of the other problems which I think is a huge issue is that we don't talk enough with our uh, educators. So as health with Sydney Silo, as researchers with Sydney Silo, as educators with Sydney Silo, and what's been really nice with this project that we're doing is that you've got educators, researchers, clinicians all in the same room trying to break down those barriers that exist for us between those cohorts. I think we need to have more of those conversations. Definitely. Thanks, Kelvin. So there is another question that um, is more for you, Kelvin, but I'm going to open it up um, to both you and Michelle. Um, and it is, oh, sorry, my computer's just glitched a little bit. Sorry, apologies. And so the question is, so is there enough importance placed in the general practice level um, about ear screening within our um, art shows? And how can we also help improve, um, you know, picking up on those things for our at high risk mums and bubs programs and making sure that we have, you know, click onto the early signs of learning difficulties and make sure we have appropriate screenings in our at show services. Yeah, as, I guess a similar answer than before, and that is that we shouldn't rely on general practitioners who are super busy mm. as it is. We need to rely on, on the carers, the parents, and getting them the tools to be able to quickly assess whether there's an issue and therefore accelerate that to go through the pathway. When we talk about pathways, it's about if you've got a child in need, how do we navigate through a health and education system to make sure if this is your child, they get the best education, the best hearing outcome, the best, edu uh, the best resources that are available, and at the moment, there are blockages all the way. So we need to start breaking down those barriers. And that's what we're talking about. And, um, and Michelle talked about so well about dismantling a lot of those kind of barriers that have been put up there uh, structurally and also systemically to try and make sure it's easier access for us all. But I do place an emphasis on Archo's playing a huge role in this. Good night, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> that was it was perfect timing though wasn't it when the lights went down it was beautiful um i was gonna just make a reflection as i am a mother i've shown my children all of my children had ear nose and throat problems as well and my focus i have had really good support from a wabakul ams ah thank you <laughs> little plug um we have a fantastic ams but um, when some of my children were born, it was half an hour drive to get to an awabical clinic and I went to a general practitioner and found that our general practices aren't so aware. I used to get really upset and say, well, I wish they would just treat my child as an Aboriginal child. This is, this is why they have these, these hearing problems. So we're in Aboriginal health. I think sometimes there's a lot of focus given to what ATCHOs need to do, but we also need to open that up. Lots of our mob don't you know, do also go to mainstream services too and we need a wider scope of health promotion and awareness. And we did have a great um, health promotion campaign a while back there in our communities, which, which I know did a lot with little Mike, um, who was out and about in community and really raising awareness for lots of our community about what to look for. But I don't think we've had lots of really targeted when our children are so little, what to be, what signs to look for. And that's all we have time for tonight. Um, thank you everyone for sending through all your questions. Um, and if anyone has any pressing yeah. questions, they can email them through to us and we'll, we'll do our best to get back to you as quickly as we can. Um, 
with some responses or some guidance or some references for you. Um, but I'll go back over here before yep. I introduce. Okay. <laughs> HMRI hosts a range of community seminars to invite you inside our labs, buildings and workspaces. Stay tuned for the next event in August, uh, which will be Healthy Aging. If you'd like to learn more about the work that we do at HMRI, please go to the website, sign up for regular updates, visit hmri.org.au to find out all about seminars, volunteer for research, and find out how to donate to health and medical research at HMRI. The team at HMRI are always happy to answer your questions, so please get in touch. To close the event, I would like to welcome our brother, Jacob Ridgway, to the stage to sing his latest song, Come Home. I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians, owners of the land we gather upon today, the Wabakal people and pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. I also want to extend that to you as watching at home and the lands that you gather upon today and your traditional countries. Um, yeah, proud Warramai Gamilaroi man and I've had a working relationship and family relationship with all the people that have presented here today. Um, me and Michelle go back to working within community and out of home care. Um, Nathan is currently PVC, I'm a student studying my Masters of Creative Industries and studying the representations of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples in media. And Uncle Kelvin, also a proud Warramai Gamilaroi man. And like you said, we, we stand upon the shoulders of those who paved the way before us. And you're definitely one of those people that we look up to. And as a singer-songwriter, I might need to call upon you one day, and I, and I have before. So I really appreciate that. And the work that you are doing in health and the work that I've done in health has taken me a lot of places, especially as an um, ambassador for Are You OK? I got to go to a little place called Halls Creek in WA in the Kimberleys and got to see the uh, work there and how important the work that you've been doing, Uncle Kelvin. They've been uh, really appreciative of the work that you do there coming in every year and um, to see them smile, to see them be able to activate their senses in education and music, I know how much it makes a, um, a difference in their lives. So this song here is I'm Not Coming Home. I wasn't raised this way I should have known better But the grim knocking at my door See him through the window Times are hard now If you've been what I've been through Tears in an empty cell Hope she's doing well Caught in the crossfire Saving my soul for heaven and hell I'm not coming home I'm not coming home Gave into the devil Learn to be numb But the poison they fed me It stuffed me up Sinful desire Blinded by smoke I was feeling all alone And that's all she wrote Caught in the crossfire of love Saving my soul for heaven and hell I'm not coming home 